Just want to show you this hardy cyclamen down here being much enjoyed by bees. This was here obviously when we moved in and I don't know if you can see what I can see at the bottom here. It's quite interesting this plant. So this is a, a species of cyclamen. This is one that's reasonably hardy and survives outdoors in the UK. Let's just wait till this bee's finished. Not sure that actually was a bee, it might have been one of those bee flies. But anyway, this round thing here, this whole big woody circular thing right here is the corm of the cyclamen. That's the underground, well, nearly underground, food storage organ for this plant. So this great big thing here is like, well, it's like a bulb. Is a corm it's not a bulb because it's not composed of layers of leaves it's a solid corky and woody and probably full of starch or inulin or one of those food storage solutions that plants have developed for getting themselves through the winter when they're not growing so i just thought that was quite interesting to see really i knew they had corms i've seen them before normally they don't get bigger than the size of like a you know a baby bell or something like that but this one's quite a whopper these are the potatoes i planted in pots quite late in the year they are starting to show signs of potential issues with blight and so I'm going to I'm going to harvest them and use them because there'll still be well hopefully some potatoes down there so I think starting with this front one which I believe is those cypress potatoes oh quiet dog right so We'll have all that top growth off just to make it easier to handle. That lot can go in the compost. And let's see what we've got in here then. That there, I think, is the original tuber, so I won't keep that. Okay, now this stuff which is just a mixture of uh, compost that I bought and some garden soil, that can go back on the garden. I'll try not to grow potatoes in it next year but it should be okay because there's no living potato <coughs> tissue in there. Well unless I've missed a little potato so that's why I won't put it on a patch that's going to have potatoes because it could be carrying blight. And that's the potato harvest. Not bad for one little bucket. I was hoping for more because I was hoping it would go on longer, but that'll do nicely. So yeah, those have scrubbed up pretty nice and they're not as big as they could be. And that's just a necessity. I had to pick them now before the blight gets them. Blight is a problem in storage, but not a problem if you want to pick and eat them fresh. So here at Shrimp Cottage, we got a slight composting problem. It's not really a serious problem. But this garden produces a lot of compostable vegetable matter. So we've got a very nice lush lawn. I can't take the credit for that. The previous occupants of the house must have really looked after this lawn. So we've got lawn clippings. We've got things like this fuchsia, which produces prolific growth and needs cutting back hard. And of course, there will be things like the squash plants, the tomato plants when they're finished, prunings from all the shrubs. And then up the top there, we've got a beach hedge at the back of the top lawn. So that needs trimming twice a year. 
We've got a very good shredder that shreds this all down nice and small, and we have got a couple of compost bins, but we've outgrown them because just of the sheer amount of compostable vegetable matter that this garden produces. So, like I say, yeah, we've outgrown the standard bins. Let me show you my new compost bin. I mean, I say new, this is not new. This is, we got, I picked this up second hand. Uh, this is a standard compost bin. This is actually meant to make two rectangular bins that are approximately the same size as that one. But I kind of figured out how to bodge it together by putting panels alternately the right way up and then the wrong way up into one great big bin. The benefit of which is that you get about five times the capacity. So an octagon, which is nearly a circle, has five times the capacity or around about five times the capacity of a rectangle or a square made out of four of the sides. So I could have just had two bins. I could have put them together in a linear arrangement and had three times the capacity. But if you open them out into an octagon, you get about five times the capacity. So I hope we won't outgrow this one. And in here we put a mixture of woody stuff, so the hedge trimmings and uh, shrubby bits and so on, all shredded up, together with grass clippings, which are quite wet and nitrogen rich. So hopefully that'll be a good mix for rotting down. It also gives us somewhere to put the top part of the compost bin, which when you come to empty these out is never completely rotted. So we'll toss that in there as well. And then we'll get the decent compost out of the bottom of these bins. That little hatch at the bottom where you're supposed to take the compost out, that never works. That cost me almost nothing because somebody was giving away these bins. All I had to do was find the posts for them, which actually we already had here. Now some of the stuff that we are rotting down in this compost heap would like to just grow again. So I've got here ivy and periwinkle and brambles. So it's going to need a little bit of pre-rotting before I put it in the compost bin. So that consists of running it through the shredder and then I'll place it in these bags and it'll stay in that bag for about a month just for any little self cuttings or whatever of ivy to die. And also if I, if I happen to be out here chopping wood or anything like that and I'm caught short, I'll pee in these bags because that will also help it break down. That might sound gross, but it's actually nitrogen that really helps break down the woody stuff. In the bags, I will put a mixture of brown and green. So basically woody carbon stuff green nitrogen stuff and that also helps it break down. Important to note these bags have perforations in them because these came from compost and so it's not anaerobic here there's aerobic decomposition happening in these bags otherwise it goes really stinky. So while we're out here shredding things up we are visited by wildlife friend. I think this is probably the same robin I saw earlier in the year it was very scruffy his plumage is now blown in properly He's looking very neat and smart. And that's him you can hear singing there. And of course he's down here because we're digging around in piles of compost. So there's all sorts of interesting food coming out of that for him. We're coming towards the end of the tomato season now. So plants are looking really quite sad. Uh, and I've taken down the autom automatic watering system because we're back from holiday now. And I'll just water these plants minimally just to keep them alive while the last few tomatoes ripen. The tank for the watering system is really full of algae. So <clears throat> I'm going to clean it out. I'll just put some bleach in there. I'll let that kill off all the algae. And then I'll probably put some dilute bleach in there and then run the pump with the pipe. So it's just pumping water out of the tank and back in to kill off all the algae inside of the pipes and anything that might be inside the pump as well before I put the pump away into storage for the winter. So that's the input tube is going to go down into this tank. I have replaced the water in this tank with a solution of bleach. None of the watering outlets are now going to the plants they're all just going looping around going straight back into the tank so now when I run this pump it's just going to cycle water up to the header tank which I'll just make sure 
Yeah, not going to spray bleach all over my plants. So I'm just going to run this a few times for like 120 seconds at a time, something like that. And it's going to run bleach solution through the pump, up to the header tank, down through the pipes, and then back into this tank through the drippers. So it'll just cycle that through. And that should hopefully kill off any of the algae that's on the inside of those pipes. So a couple of things to do here in the upstairs garden. These are my squashes. These are the ones that grew from my volunteer squash seeds. And these are winter squashes. And they need to ripen a little bit before I pick them. So I've got to leave them out here, let the sun and wind get on them to dry out and harden the skin and then they will store but I'm just going to lift them up off the ground so that they're not in contact with damp soil so I've got some old roof tiles I'm going to carefully lift up each squash and just slip a tile underneath it so that it's not sitting on damp soil okay well that was mostly successful one of them just detached itself when I was lifting it so that may indicate that that stalk there is already corked as they call it and that might be as far as that one's going to ripen. Anyway, we'll use that one first. The others, I'm going to leave them on there until sometime before the first frost, and then we'll pick them and get them into a frost-free, sort of cool place. Now, what's interesting about these squashes is, look, one of them's gone orange, one of them is yellow, one of them is dark green. These all came from seeds from the same squash, which tends to indicate to me that the squash that I the volunteer squash that grew them was maybe the seed of an F1 hybrid and so we've got all the different various ancestral genetics coming out now. Anyway, I'm sure they're all going to be fine. The other thing is that we've been away for a week and there are various courgettes in awkward places, including one very awkward place. There's a courgette here that must have, well I think it's well on its way to becoming a marrow can't really actually see where it is but it's grown around the corner here so I'm going to carefully get that out and we'll see what it looks like so that's not bad these plants are still bearing even though they really look like they're on their last legs they're still having one last go at producing fruit and I'm not going to stop them there's more courgettes there to pick later and as long as the frost stays off we might still get a few more fruit off of them So there's two very nice youngish courgettes there and this one which is the one that grew around a corner. So a corner courgette or corner jet as I like to call it. So these yard long beans that are in this plot by the greenhouse that didn't really do very much at all have suddenly decided they're going to start growing like crazy. I think this suggests that these are day length sensitive. Some tropical plants are what they call day length sensitive which means that they won't grow in sort of northern climates until the days start shortening. They're triggered into growth by subtle changes in day length and in northern temperate zones they won't start really producing until the days start getting shorter which in the UK obviously means it's getting colder and autumn is coming and that's what seems to be happening here. So we've actually got beans produced here. I shall let these continue developing and we'll see what happens. We've got a few more here as well. The plot is overrun with weeds. I did leave it like that on purpose because I wanted to see what would grow and see what would happen here. Everything seems to have actually picked up here now. So maybe there was some problem with the soil, which has now resolved itself and washed out. The other thing to say is that the ants have finished here as well. So the ant colony that was here is now finished. So it could still be that the problem with this little plot was the ants in there. The tomatoes in the greenhouse are starting to sort of do a diminishing returns thing where I am still getting ripe tomatoes, but I'm also losing a lot of the tomatoes as they ripen. They're either rotting because of various ailments or things are eating them. I think sometimes the birds come in here in a little peck. 
And of course, there's wood license lugs and all sorts of other things competing for my tomatoes. So I think we're going to draw a line under it. There are some ripe tomatoes to pick today, but I think I'm going to pick the green tomatoes and we're going to make fried green tomatoes and dried green tomatoes. So that's the tomato plants cleared out of the greenhouse. I think I'll leave the pepper plants in there for a moment. They're looking a little bit sad because I took the watering system out, then forgot to water them, but they'll perk up. And scotch bonnets are doing extremely well. I don't know what I'm going to do with that many scotch bonnets. And weirdly, the aubergine plant, I cut that down a while ago when it stopped fruiting after we picked the last of the fruits. It's coming back. I don't think there's time for that to actually grow again and fruit again, but we'll see. I'm going to leave it be and see what happens. So that's all the tomato plants and a couple of peppers that I took out. I'm going to shred that up and that will go on the compost. These are peat free tomato planters. I think this is probably going to go on the compost heap as well. Quite a lot of wasps in here. Actually, I imagine they're just after the rotten tomatoes that f fell off the back and I missed. I hope I don't have a wasp's nest in there. I think there'd be more wasps if I did. What I might do is just slip one of these bags open and have a look inside. I'm expecting that this is going to be pretty much. Well, no, it's not actually. I thought this would be a solid mass of tomato roots. They obviously couldn't get out the bottom of the bags, mostly, because I didn't really want to grow them in the greenhouse soil. They're little centipedes. Well, there's a grub of some sort there. That's a moth larva, most likely. I'll just leave that. What other animals have we got under here? That's probably where there's been an ant's nest. Lots and lots and lots of wood lice. They're the guys that have been eating the tomatoes, doing that. But we still have plenty of tomatoes for us, so I don't begrudge them. They are decomposers in the garden. We can't eradicate them anyway, so we've just got to live alongside them. So now the tomatoes in the greenhouse are all tidied away, I thought it'd be worth doing a little review of the varieties I grew this year, and maybe deciding whether to grow them next year or deciding what to do. Bearing in mind this is a review of not just the varieties of tomato, but how they performed under my care. So it's by definition very subjective. So these are the tags kind of clockwise around the greenhouse. So Gardener's Delight, that one performed pretty well. It was the first tomato to ripen and they were nice little cherry tomatoes. They tasted good, thin skins. Yeah, nothing to complain about there. And that went on cropping throughout the season. So Gardener's Delight, I think, is a possibility for next year. Alicante just didn't do all that well for me actually. I got a few tomatoes off it, but they didn't really ripen all that well. Uh, they didn't ripen very evenly, I thought. That was quite interesting. But yeah, I didn't get a huge crop off of that one. That was the second one by the door, so it got plenty of water, but it just didn't do all that well. Likewise, Moneymaker. I got a few tomatoes off of it. Roma was good, but plum tomatoes are of kind of limited use. Uh, they were nice tomatoes. They are better for cooking, I think, than eating in salads. Good for sort of grilling and frying and so on. But not sure I'm going to bother with plum tomatoes again, because you can cook with any variety of tomato. You can't necessarily use this for any other purpose. Golden Sunrise, I think, was the best of the bunch. Delicious, soft, thin-skinned, tasty, bright yellow tomatoes. Definitely going to do that one again. I think if there's one variety from this lot that I do grow again next year, it's definitely going to be that one. Tigerella was good. Medium-sized crops on this one, but interesting appearance. Nice, stripy, tasty tomatoes. I suppose that's a maybe. Honeycomb. Very prolific crop of small orange tomatoes. Hugely productive, but tomatoes had a marked tendency to split, either while they were still on the vine or just after picking as they ripened a little bit more. That might be my inconsistent watering, but the other thing I found with these is they fall off really easily as well. So I lost a lot of these tomatoes. Just while I was picking, you pick one tomato off the bunch and other tomatoes on the bunch fall off quite easily. So I think whilst that was a good cropper, I think that's probably a no for next year. Um, Shirley F1, I only had about three or four tomatoes off of that one, so that's no. Not really sure what went wrong there. Could be me. Pear drops. Interesting little tomatoes. Very small plant. 
and it didn't do all that well. It succumbed to some sort of disease and it's just died early on. We had some nice, interesting little tomatoes, although the flavour isn't that great. Shape and colour is interesting. Flavour, mm, not so much. Beef Master, I think, did really well. Very lovely. Big tomatoes off of that. But I'm not really sure. I mean, I like big tomatoes, but not sure I'm going to bother with that one again. And Marmande. I had some really nice, interesting looking tomatoes off of this, but again, not a massive crop. We had loads of tomatoes, but it was spread across all these varieties. And I think really the ones I'm, I'm thinking I might grow again is these two, Tigerella and, and no, Tigerella and Golden Sunrise. Gardener's Delight. Well, Gardener's Delight, maybe. So I think those three are worth considering for next year. This lot, I think, will put them aside and we'll try something else. Well, try, there's plenty more tomato varieties to try. So I'm thinking next year I want to try a different colour, so like a black tomato or a green tomato, and perhaps some more heirloom type varieties or something like that. And I'm probably going to grow fewer tomato plants next year and try and give them a bit more space and look after them a bit better so we get a heavier crop from a smaller number of plants. Right, so there we go. That's the shredded tomato plants on top of the broken up grow bag contents in the compost. It's good actually because the layer underneath that was grass clippings. So we've got brown compost, we've got green again. So it keeps the mix of carbon and nitrogen kind of fairly even in here. Also, all those wood lights we saw under the grow bags, well, there were just as many inside the grow bags. And this is their new home now, and they can do a good job in here decomposing this compost, breaking it all down, chewing up all this green stuff, turning it into compost for us. So the big, oh no, hello, there's the robin again. I think he's probably waiting for me to get out of the way so that he can get down there and have a little inspect. So that's the big compost bin, nearly half full now. And once we finish filling this for the autumn, we'll get a tarp over the top or something to, so it doesn't get waterlogged in the winter. This squash, which is one of my volunteer squashes, one of my volunteer seedling squashes that I brought with me from the old house, I think I might have figured out what these are at long last. I think these might be vegetable spaghetti, which is a type of squash which, when it's baked, the flesh inside breaks up into strands that you can serve a little bit like spaghetti, but not exactly. Anyway, that's what we're going to put to the test today. Just going to give it a little wash, and then we'll cut it up and roast it and see what happens. Okay. Washing was really just to prevent us from transferring grit from the outside to the inside. Let's have a look and see what we've got inside of here. Now, expecting this to be quite difficult to cut because this is a winter squash. And so the skin on the outside is quite hard. And there we go. Now, these stringy bits are just where the seeds were attached. So although that ha has got a certain spaghetti-like texture to it. That's not the vegetable spaghetti. That's not the bit we're after. If this is what I think it is, we're going to find that once it's cooked, the whole of the flesh breaks up in a similar way. It's not as orange inside as some vegetable spaghettis I've seen. We'll have a little sprinkle of salt on there. I'll just rub that in. And the idea of this is just to draw out a bit of moisture and give us a firmer texture to the flesh once it's cooked. Meanwhile, I'm told that these seeds, you can just roast them and they're edible. Now, I always thought pumpkin seeds of the type that you could eat directly didn't have a skin on them like this. They're the green type, but they're called peelless pumpkins. These have got a little bit of a skin on them. But anyway, we're going to toast these. We're going to have the oven on anyway, so we might as well try. I'll spread these out on a tray. Just the seeds, not the stringy bits. And of course, the other thing I could do with these seeds would be to dry them out and use them for growing more pumpkins next year. But I have plenty more squashes up there. So if I want to do that, I can still. But I think next year I might grow a different variety of squash. I've got somewhat of a limitation on space for squashes here. So I think I might try something different next year. All right, a little bit of salt on these. A little bit of chilli powder. Maybe a little splash of oil on there. Right. 
and see what happens. Meanwhile, the squash, well, I suppose it was worth salting it. There's a little bit of moisture there, which I'll just dab off with some kitchen paper towel. Not a lot. I doubt that makes a massive difference. So these will get a little splash of oil as well. I'll just brush that over the whole surface. And that's going to actually get on the same tray as the seeds. Cut side down. Apparently that's the right way to do it. And that needs to go in the oven for 40 minutes. I don't think the seeds will need that long. All right, at the midpoint of cooking. Those seeds look pretty well done to me. In fact, some of them might be a little bit over. So I think we'll have those out of there. Let them cool down a little bit before we try and taste them. Squash can go back in for a bit longer. Now these have cooled down just a little bit. Let's give them a try. Not bad. Yep. That little bit of skin on there doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I thought these would need peeling like sunflower seeds. But nothing of the sort, no. Just They're just really crunchy and tasty. Yeah. I like that. These have had about 40 minutes in the oven. Just flip it over carefully and have a look. And I think we can see yeah, it is sort of coming apart into strands. So I think we do have vegetable spaghetti here. Now, what I'm going to do is just let those cool down a little bit before I try and get that out of there. And we're going to serve this a bit like a pasta dish, but we need a sauce to go with it. And very fortunately, through the year, as we've been having lots of courgettes and tomatoes, I made some sauce which I've frozen down. So I think that's going to be our, our sauce to go with it. And we could, I suppose, just have these sprinkled on top, because there's here's your protein. And that would then be an entire meal cooked with things from the garden. We could have thrown some potatoes in there, some green beans as well. But I am just going to have a bit of fried bacon with this as well. Right, that courgette and tomato sauce is going to go into the same pan as the bacon was cooked in. And just warm that through there. And then the bacon, which I've diced, now it's nice and crispy, is going to go on the top. While that's warming up, we just prepare the squash, which is going to go like this. So we just kind of fork it out of the shell and I wouldn't say it's that much like spaghetti it's got quite a nice fluffiness to it not all soggy and wet like you might expect and then just to lift that up a little bit and make it a little bit more pasta like I've got some grana padano Italian hard cheese we'll just give that a little toss in all right and then we're going to have some of this tomato and courgette sauce over the top. Courgettes obviously being another squash. There we go. And then I finish mine off with a bit more cheese. I'll give Jenny the choice. So what's it like? Just get a bit of the squash, a bit of that sauce, cheese. Hmm, pretty good. Actually, this squash has got an interestingly buttery flavour. Could just be the cheese I added. But yeah, it's got a really buttery sweetness to it. And I am quite heartened to see that these are hard shells, which means that the squashes have started ripening properly. Today's insect friend is a hawk moth caterpillar. Now these hawk moths are interesting. The caterpillars have markings that look like snakes. So, so yeah, it looks like a little reptile, doesn't it? With these big spots here, which I'm fairly sure are probably not eyes. So it'll rear up like that. And it's 
That's to make birds frightened. Okay, I looked it up and this appears to be the caterpillar of the elephant hawk moth, which does indeed feed on fuchsias. And it's more than welcome to. It's more than paid its way already just by making me happy to see it. I have a bit of a soft spot for moths. So I'm going to have a look around and see if we've got any more on the other fuchsias. Because we have no shortage of fuchsias in this garden. Well, who knows, there might be some in here. There's a great thicket of fuchsias here. There might well be some more of those caterpillars. And good luck to them. And I hope to see them as adult moths, because the elephant hawk moth is quite a striking moth. Both in terms of size and colour and appearance. I can't see any more. But then I wouldn't necessarily because they're perhaps tucked away right in the middle. Here is today's insect friend, a very hairy caterpillar, making its way across the path here. I'm not sure what kind of caterpillar that is, not sure. It could be any kind of butterfly or moth actually. I'm not very up on the larvae of butterflies and moths. Anyway, there it goes, into the undergrowth. Today's insect friend, hairy caterpillar. If you know what caterpillar that is, if you know what species that is, do let me know in the comments. Today we're going for a walk at Culpepper's Dish, which is near Afpuddle in Dorset. It's a big sinkhole apparently, somewhere over here. I don't know if we're actually looking at it. Yeah, this might actually be it. That might be it. Anyway, we're going to have a little wander around these woods. I brought the basket. It's the end of August. There might be mushrooms. Yeah, I think that might be it. I've got to say, when I saw sinkhole on the map, I was expecting something Perhaps a little bit more dramatic than that. Yeah. Never mind. According to the map, there might be a deeper sinkhole over there, but I am not going wading through bracken. That would be an invitation to be bitten by ticks. So hopefully the footpath will curve around that way and we can have a look. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, so there's a footpath that goes down that way, so towards Bryant's Puddle. So we'll walk down this way and see what we can find. Yeah, so I think you can probably get more of an idea of it from over here. So yeah, a big kind of broad sinkhole. No idea why it's called Culpepper's Dish. If you know, let me know in the comments. I mean, the dish part is obvious. Look at these big pine cones. Big old pine cones from a tree with big old pine cones. I suppose I probably shouldn't be standing here. This is where you get clobbered by falling pine cones, except it's not a windy day, so the risk is minimal. That's a decent sized pine cone. And we can see there, a squirrel's been nibbling at that one to get the pine nuts out of the inside. I might take a few of these for the fire. Or for crafts. They make very good fire lighters. That's 
suppose it might be interesting to crack one open and get some pine nuts out of it. There's a nice solid one. Although, I can't eat pine nuts. Pine nuts are my nemesis in the same way that sulfites are Jenny's. Yeah, I think we'll take a few pine cones home today. Perhaps for some winter crafting, Christmas decorations or something, or maybe just to burn on the fire, or maybe bugs. Maybe a Christmas decoration that's designed to be burned. Oh, scary hole. Superbly tranquil here. I can hear distant roads. But I think sometimes it's nice to be out in the woods and hear a road far away because it just reminds you that you're not right next to it. Wow, look at all of these. Picking them up for the fire. Well, or crafts or something, so, you know. A bit. So that's interesting chunk of branch with the pine cones still attached. That I think might make a nice centerpiece or base for a Christmas table decoration. I know folks don't like me mentioning Christmas right now but it's called planning. So we've got common earth balls here so there are some fungi about although these things tend to be pretty hardy so these will appear even if it's quite dry weather. My feeling is that it's probably a little bit too dry here to find many fungi right now. So walking downhill again, I don't know if this is still part of Culpeper's dish, maybe it is. So maybe it's uh claim to fame is it's broad rather than deep. We'll have a look down here. Yeah, Dan's just spotted these. These are common earth balls. Loads and loads of them. At first they look like stones sticking out of the bank there yeah. but that is a fungus yeah whole cluster of them down there so yeah this bit here might be part of Culpepper's dish I don't know it looks like there's a kind of a bit kind of a valley along here actually rather than rather than circular depression. Eva. 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 What are you doing? Come on out of here. So I think in the spirit of the viewer who commented about looking at mosses, we'll just spend a moment appreciating this beautiful moss here. The little fruits there. So it might kind of look a bit like devastation. This is a managed forest. And it turns out they're managing it to restore it more to the natural flora here. So they're reducing the conifer plantings to reinstate the natural deciduous plants, beech, oak. I suppose it would be ash, but I don't think planting ash at the moment is a particularly 
viable proposition given that uh, it's we've got this ash dieback thing. I can see wild strawberry plants in there. Too late for strawberries now though I think. And of course blackberry plants everywhere. In fact this one here I think might be a dewberry. Even though it hasn't got the characteristic bloom of a dewberry it's got that thing where the droplets are quite large and irregular and fewer of them than a regular blackberry. There's some more of them over there. Oh wow. They could actually be a blackberry dewberry hybrid. In fact this one I think might be a raspberry dewberry hybrid. Just going by the no, blackberry dewberry I would say. It's got thorns but it's got that bloomy fruit. Right, I need to go and drop this in the car, I think, and then we'll continue walking. So that's obviously another big sinkhole over here. And these sinkholes happen quite a lot here because it's limestone overlaid by acid heath. And so the acidic water that runs through the peat and the conifers and the heather and everything then dissolves the limestone underneath. You get a cavern that cre is created and then it caves in and creates a sinkhole. That is a rather nice looking blackberry and even though we're by a road this is a road where about three cars every day go past so i think we're probably okay to pick blackberries from a roadside do you want one jenny oh. wow very sweet another one of these sinkholes here you can definitely see what's going on here I did originally when I encountered a lot of these when we first moved down here assume that these were man-made and had been dug out for flints or for the chalk or clay or whatever but apparently they are mostly sinkholes natural caused by acidic groundwater leaching away the limestone underneath see down here we got a truly enormous and impressive and deep sinkhole which I don't think even has a name but look at that one it goes all the way down I'm not sure you can really actually see that very well on the camera but you could build a four-story house in there and it wouldn't stick out the top look at this earth ball over here that's about as big as they get really sausage fingers for scale Now we are heading downhill and it does seem to be getting more green and moist so you know we might be lucky with the mushrooms down here somewhere you never know the smell of the forest is just amazing combination of just leafy green smells pine resin aromatic herbs there's probably some thyme or something like that around marjoram all combining to make a, a quite amazing scent but we'll keep going down and see where it goes what is with this is we've got to come back up again I would have expected to encounter more people today since it is Bank Holiday Monday. I thought we would see a few more people out for a walk. Perhaps they've all gone to the coast. 
very similar to the new forest actually the kind of tracks they've laid yeah uh, the general species the habitats the little bit more hilly perhaps than the new forest or the places we used to go most commonly lovely heather there two different species at least i'm saying i think the deeper magenta one is bell heather i'm not sure about the other one over here if you can hear it it's not going to do it now that bird there that i think is a chiff chaff but not the most common chiff chaff call it makes let's see if i'm right i've been trying to learn bird calls based on using the merlin app Oh, it's a willow warbler, it says. No, oh, it says that's a willow warbler. I thought that was the the less common call of a chiff chaff because that's what it told me last time I heard something like that, but perhaps there's some subtle difference. I thought willow warblers were more commonly found next to rivers and whatnot. This is a coniferous, well, mixed coniferous and birch forest, so that would seem to be unusual. So maybe further down the hill, where it's a bit more boggy, there is a great big low-lying area down there, so maybe there's a marsh down there. Maybe it was a willow warbler we heard. Interesting tree over there. Is that a holly? Is that a holly with berries on over there? Yes. It's very early in the year for it to have berries, isn't it? Yeah, it's rather a good specimen too, isn't it? Yeah. Just really unusual to find it with berries on at this time of year. Oh well. Next to this little marshy bit here, over there, I can't get to it unfortunately to show you a closer view, those reddish plants are sundew, a carnivorous plant that we have as a native here in the UK. I'll see if I can find a specimen. Oh, here's one down here. So here we go. Sundew, related to Venus flytraps, and it has these little pads with stalks on them, each tipped with a little sticky droplet and insects wander over that and get entangled in the sticky goo and then the leaf or pad slowly closes up around them and digests them so that's a native carnivorous plant gonna make a mental note to come back here in spring this area here has been clear felled and that's allowed some of the plants that have been dormant in the soil to pop up a lot of that foliage you can see there is foxgloves and there's a lot of it so i think we'll come back here in spring when the foxgloves are flowering because this if i'm right should be a sight to see so i think that's pretty much our trip to the woods around culpepper's dish we're heading back to the car now we couldn't find a circular walk but we haven't looked at a map or anything so we were just trying to feel our way through it so we're heading back along the path we came out on. The big dragonfly there just zipped past. There it goes. Not that big actually. Small dragonfly. It's around about the middle of September. And we've had a few days of rain. So we thought we'd come out in the woods, see if there's any mushrooms to be found.
either this way. So here's a plant that doesn't belong here. This is uh, Lesteria formosa, pheasant berry. This is not a native plant. I imagine this must have come here as a seed, probably by, carried by a bird. These berries are what the birds are after. And they're really weird squashy berries. I have tasted them before and I'm going to taste them again now. Kind of chocolate caramel flavour. But really gloopy jelly like texture. Anyway, yeah, that's pheasant berry. Doesn't belong here. This is the uh, rather invasive rhododendron. It's a pest in a lot of woodlands. It has, well, here are some of the flowers. I think that was probably the reason it ended up in this country. Somebody brought it back for a garden or a collection. But it's very invasive and unfortunately it kills other plants beneath it. It's kind of one of these plants that demands exclusivity. And so, when it grows, it starves everything below it of light and nutrients. And I have a feeling it actually creates some sort of natural herbicide effect that also kills things that grow beneath it. Not sure this is a very good example of them, but there are some deep pits here called rain barrows, mentioned in Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles apparently, and according to the sign, the information sign back that way, these were Bronze Age burial pits called pit barrows. Reportedly at the bottom of these rain barrows, try and get a better picture of one in a minute, they found cremation urns from the Bronze Age, which are now in the Dorchester Museum. Not sure we're going to get a better view of them because it's quite overgrown with gorse and bracken. This I think might be a better example where we can see, well, I mean, you can see there's a hole. <laughs> so yeah, rain barrows, a Bronze Age burial pit. Now it might well be that they did take advantage of a natural landscape feature that's common here in Dorset, which is sinkholes, and which is where the underlying limestone or chalk gets eroded by acidic soil, often acidic soil washing through heathland like this, that then erodes the limestone underneath and creates a sinkhole. So whilst this certainly was used as a burial pit in Bronze Age times, it's quite likely that it started as a natural landscape feature uh, which was a little bit of a sinkhole. Perhaps they dug it deeper. So this looks like it could be a good place to pick bilberries next year. Maybe without getting bitten by ticks. Although, maybe they're also here. It seems likely. Well, it seems likely they'd also be here, but maybe we can get to the bilberries without traversing the uh, bracken. So we've had a little wander around here and I haven't really found anywhere that looks very promising for going off the main track into the woods to look for mushrooms. Get a kind of sense for it. These planted conifers here probably won't yield very much interesting fungi. The woodland here is just a bit too young. 
and artificial and some of the more mature woodland is really really overgrown underneath and I don't feel like hacking through undergrowth today so call me lazy if you wish I can't be bothered I think I saw something there it might be a leaf actually I think that's a yellow swamp russula in there So it might be that we just enjoy a pleasant walk in the woods. Not very flat in there, it's not very um No, it's very lumpy. Yeah. Steve's having a great time. What you got? What you got? Rock. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of pits and holes and stuff in there. Now it probably is worth mentioning that my sense of what looks like a promising place for foraging is somewhat conditioned by where I used to live in Hampshire, you know where I've spent most of my adult life and things might be a little bit different here in Dorset. The terrain is different, the flora, the landscape, the underlying soil is different. So I will have to adjust my expectations and whatnot to that. Somebody's made an illegal bike trail there. There was a sign at the car park saying don't make bike trails. People are making mountain bike trails in the woods apparently. And it's, uh, it's wearing away the topsoil and eroding out the trees. Well anyway, the forestry people don't want it to happen. But anyway. Very nice big birch trees here. You know, birch is sometimes a good tree to find seps underneath. I think we might still be a little bit early in the year here in September, so maybe we just need to come out a few more times. It's only recently got a little bit damp again after a dry spell in the summer. What I was chiefly hoping to find today was cauliflower fungus on the roots of these conifers, these various pine trees and other conifers here. But again, as I say, we haven't really had a chance to go very far off the main track just because of the thickness of the undergrowth and understory layer. So we really didn't see very many fungi apart from a few earth balls and I think one yellow swamp rustula. But I don't mind. We've had a pleasant walk in the woods. It's very quiet and peaceful here. Right, since we are in Cumbria at the moment, I went to the butchers in Ulverston and bought Cumberland sausage. So we're going to have that for lunch. Sausage in a bun. I think these are called barn cakes. I think that's what they call bread rolls up here. Anyway, let's get that in the frying pan. So what makes Cumberland sausages different? Well, for one thing, they're typically presented like this in a spiral, but the spices are quite particular. It's got quite a strong representation of pepper, nutmeg, mace, which are your usual sausages, but the blend is particular to Cumberland. Anyway, I'm gonna get that going. 
and then I'll get a lid on it because that's going to, it's a thick old sausage so it's going to take a while to cook. And then to go with that we just have some sliced onions which I'll fry. Decided I wasn't really happy taking risks with the knives here at the holiday cottage so I went out and bought a knife. I haven't got one this size anyway so that'll actually be quite handy. About 20 minutes into cooking and I have flipped it again looking very nice and you can see the juices have come out of the sausage and it's kind of stewing in its own juices now. A big sausage like this best if it's cooked slow because it will just be really succulent but also a little bit caramelised on the skin. Right I reckon that's about done so I'm going to turn that off now and I'll let it rest for just five minutes just but otherwise it's going to be very difficult to cut when it's scalding hot but also that will just let those juices distribute inside the sausage. I know it's a sausage not a piece of expensive meat but resting it will still make it better. Which just gives me time to get the bread ready. I don't have a proper bread knife so I'll do the best I can with this. Yeah as I say I think these are called balm cakes. Balm as in uh, balm is the yeasty stuff that you use to make beer. They are just soft white bread rolls, although the texture inside is a bit different to a bit lighter and more lacy. Perhaps, I don't know. So those are ready. Let's see how that sausage looks now. All right, now, and while it would be tempting to just find a very large roll to just cram all of that in one of these balm cakes, it would just about fit. This is not all for me. So some of this is for Jenny. It looks about fair. Okay, so there's our sausage in there, and then for me, because I like that kind of thing, some caramelised onions. Now mustard would be perfect on this, but I don't have any. So we'll have a bit of black pepper. A lot of black pepper. There's already quite a bit of pepper in these sausages. But what I do have, a little bit of fire, since we don't have mustard, I'll just put a few chilli flakes on there. All right, so Cumberland Sausage Balm. That is really good. It's a really good sausage. As a sausage, it's a slightly coarser grind, quite a lot of fat in it, quite well seasoned, but superbly balanced. And to go with this, which will help to really cut through that grease, we've got some homemade lemonade that we bought in Fourpenny Cafe and Shop, wasn't it? Mm. In Alverston. Let's just give that a taste. That's certainly worth a Oh, that's really good. So, yeah, that is a sausage sandwich. It's time again for the comment positivity section and this is where I'm just going to pick out a few comments that either make me smile or laugh or perhaps were uplifting in some way or comments that asked an interesting question that I'd like to answer. So, starting with, um, why aren't you monetized? I've watched like 15 videos and I haven't seen an advert. So there are ads on my channel and that does, that does pay my bills, but about a few months ago, I think in April, YouTube took away the overlay ads, which is the ones you would see about here. So YouTube decided to, to get rid of those. I think they were only working on a desktop platform anyway, so those have gone away. I don't use mid-roll ads because I don't like them. Although interestingly, it looks like one day I may not have a choice. YouTube's just announced that they're going to change the way that creators can choose ads on videos. Up until now, it's been possible when you're uploading a video to choose the kind of ads that will be shown in pre-roll and post-roll. So you could choose whether you're going to use skippable or non-skippable ads or no ads at all. 
um, and at the beginning and end of your video. YouTube is taking away that choice. They've framed that as we're making things easier for you. But in reality, obviously, that's we're making things more profitable for us. But anyway, they're taking away the choice. So I can't any longer, for example, decide not to use unskippable ads, which I used to do sometimes because like on the slow TV stuff and also on the really short scam information videos, I used to not show unskippable ads on those because the scam information things I think it's I think it's kind of important that people could just get to the information as quickly as possible the videos are only like a minute and a half long anyway and so I didn't really want somebody to have to sit through 30 seconds of ad in order to get to some critical information about a scam that only lasts a minute unfortunately that's been taken away now so there are going to be unskippable ads showing when YouTube thinks they're appropriate similarly on the slow TV I used to not put unskippable ads there because again it's the, these are kind of calming videos about nature and whatnot and I didn't really want anybody to have to sit through you know 45 seconds of commercial in order to get to the video which is about sitting by a calm river and relaxing so again that's gone away and unfortunately now YouTube is going to choose the kind of ads that go on uploads from now on at the moment I still have the choice about mid-roll ads. So I don't use mid-roll ads in my videos because I don't like them. However, reading between the lines on that announcement from YouTube, it does look like at some point in the future they're probably going to take that choice away as well. But for now, no mid-roll ads on this channel. As long as I can make that a reality, I will. Yeah, so I am monetized, but not to the kind of maximum level because I think it's more important that you see the content than it is that you see the ads. Anyway, Moving on. Comment about the rock tumbling. If you have rocks that you could describe as your favourite, then I don't think it's possible to describe the process of, as a failure on any real level. And that's fair enough. I think it's. I think that's right. Interesting point there, really, because I do think sometimes we focus on how far short of perfection we've fallen. And you'll always fall short of perfection. Well, I will, anyway. Um, and so, rather than focus, yeah, rather than focusing on how far short you've come why don't we just think about how far we have come because yeah there were some rocks out of that lot out of that first batch my first attempt at rock tumbling there were some rocks out of that batch that i really did enjoy and i've kept and i've got them on my windowsill by my editing pc actually and every now and then i just pick one up and admire it and enjoy holding it so yeah definitely a success that that project i will do some more rock tumbling at some point in the future i'm just trying to find out where i can actually legally go and collect rocks from how would you describe Atomic Shrimp overall aesthetic? I'd call it Disco Rustic. <laughs> I do like that, Disco Rustic. New shirt, by the way. Is this shirt Disco Rustic? Um, someone else said, I think I might call it benignly eccentric. I like to wear the same sorts of colourful patterns. So I hope it's benign. Oh, absolutely. I, I've, I think in the past, um, described it as the mild-mannered pursuit of absurdity. I know that the patterns on my plates and my tablecloth and my shirts and everywhere else in my life are busy and loud and not everybody likes them but here's the point I do uh, I really like color and pattern and it makes me happy and so I use a lot of it and that's my aesthetic so yeah I do actually from time to time get people saying to me oh you should put your food on white plates and use a white tablecloth so that we can really you know get the the, the effect of the food and it's just no no, no not going to happen the the weird tablecloth on the studio desk here and the one in the dining room and the pattern on the plates is not just part of my everyday life it's part of the kind of branding of this channel now and it would be a terrible shame if that went away so it's not going to this is on the dried green tomatoes. But you tried, and it was an interesting experiment, so worth it in my book. And that's a that's another thing that I'm coming to think of more and more, is my kind of recipe for happiness is to stop wondering about it and just try. And especially when there's no not very much cost involved or not much risk involved or something like that. Certainly if, you know, if the, I don't know, if you're curious about jumping off a cliff with a wingsuit I would say okay maybe the answer isn't stop wondering and try but 
if it's just about, OK, what happens if I dry out some green tomatoes? Well, I could wonder about that for the rest of my life, or I could just dry it and see what happens. Turns out it wasn't that great, but now I know. So this is one from my first ever use of an air fryer in that one about Walney Island Beach, where we got some sea beet and we took it home and made sea beet toasties in an air fryer. Brilliant idea for the sandwich in the fryer. I wonder if you have any plans to buy an air fryer yourself. I bought one earlier this year and I find it really useful. I've hardly had to turn the main oven on at all since, but would love some more of your innovative recipes for using it. Well, thank you. Um, I have a problem with space in my kitchen, actually. We'll just have, go and have a look while I'm talking at the space or lack thereof in my kitchen here at Shrimp Cottage. It is a tiny, tiny kitchen and we have no more space for appliances. We're going to get the kitchen redone. We're going to do something about that. But what the something isn't going to make more space in that kitchen. We're going to organise that space better and get a decent oven in there and some worktops that aren't falling apart and so on. But we're not going to have more space in the kitchen. So if I do get an air fryer, we're going to have to have a solution where I've got somewhere else I can put it when we're not using it. Because there is such little workspace in that kitchen at the moment. There just literally is not space for another uh, another appliance. Now, every time I, I answer this question in the comments, people often say, oh, yeah, but they're not very big. They don't take up very much space. But the point is, this is a tiny, tiny kitchen and there is no more space in that kitchen, not as it's organised at the moment. Anyway, so the plan is we're going to do something about that kitchen. We're going to do something about storage in general. I don't think all the storage necessarily has to be in the kitchen, but I'm not sure whether we're going to get an air fryer. I did enjoy using it, but not sure I've got space for one. Oh yeah, <laughs> I love how YouTube's auto-generated captions translates Eva's barking into foreign. I mentioned this in the last one, actually, last video actually. Sometimes YouTube just puts foreign in the caption if it's music or a sound it doesn't recognise or whatever. Uh, yeah, it translates Eva's barking into foreign, which I suppose is basically correct. Yeah, Eva is Portuguese. Eva is an adopted dog. We adopted her as a puppy from Portugal. She was rescued by an animal rescue charity, brought back to the UK, given all her shots and everything like that, given a doggy passport, which is the cutest thing ever. And she was, um, and we adopted her. So she is Portuguese. Maybe that's why she doesn't always do what I tell her. Maybe I should speak to her in Portuguese. People always ask me, what breed is Eva? Because she's adopted, we don't know. Um, our assumption is that she is a cross between something like maybe a rat terrier. And I reckon she's got a little bit of whippet or Italian greyhound or something like that. One of those running, leggy, long doggo breeds in her as well. Because you can see it when you look at her um, her anatomy. She's got the really deep chest and the, the tummy tuck of a greyhound, Italian greyhound, whippet, something like that. So, um, But she's got the temperament and yappiness of a terrier. And, and also she's, she's got the look and coloration of a, say, a rat terrier or something like that. So we think the answer to that question, and we could be wrong, is that she's a cross between a terrier and a whippet, which is interestingly the same cross that gives rise to Manchester Terriers, which again, Eva does look a bit like a Manchester Terrier, but she's smaller than a true Manchester Terrier, larger than a toy Manchester Terrier, so she's not a Manchester Terrier. But she looks a bit like one. So there's two questions here actually. Mike, has your YouTube channel driven you to go out to places you would not otherwise have visited? I'm not sure, really. I mean, we like to go to places anyway. We like to explore stuff anyway. So I think there probably are times when I've said, I want to go somewhere this week that I can make into a video. So we go out somewhere and visit a beach somewhere or a hill or a castle or, a, you know, village or something like that. So I think there are times where the intent to make a video about something interesting has driven the choice to go somewhere. But uh, but we like doing that kind of thing anyway. So very much, it's very significantly true that my YouTube channel really is just more about documenting the things I would have done anyway. But yeah, sometimes I, I go to places, sometimes I will go further than I would do if I didn't have the camera rolling. I suppose a good example of that is the the Hode Hill video. So we were walking up Hode Hill and when we on the way back down there was a little stream tri trickling down the hillside and I thought it came from a spring up on the hill. It turned out it was a drain but same idea. I probably wouldn't have walked up that hill to have a look at the source of that stream if I didn't have the camera with me. I might have done but 
some of those sorts of things where it, I'm walking along, there's something interesting. It's just like, oh, I think we ought to explore that because I think people might find that interesting. So sometimes the fact that I have a camera in my hand stimulates me to be a little bit more curious than I might otherwise. And that's a good thing. I I enjoy being curious. So that's a good thing, really, that the this this isn't just giving me something to do. It's driving me to be more me. The other part is I realise time is the currency for these things, but pre-YouTube, would you have seen your retirement as active as your full-time YouTube career has provided? Don't really know because I didn't. I, I never plan anything like this. I, my, my whole career has been completely unplanned. Um, but yeah, I don't know what I thought it would be like being a full-time YouTuber. But um, yeah, it's keeping me out, keeping me active. I'm glad that I've been able to carry on doing the things I want rather than trying to pursue the algorithm and trying to make videos that are commercially successful and so on. I'm actually kind of glad to, that all of those review videos are behind me, really. I, I sometimes buy things and review them if I want the thing. But um, but yeah, I, I'm kind of glad to be able to not be doing the YouTube thing in the sense that YouTube wants you to go and make successful videos. I don't think I anticipated that I would be making so many videos about interesting places and stuff like that and for it to be a success. So didn't really see it coming, but didn't really know what I was expecting to see coming. That's not much of an answer, is it? Uh, what's the place where you were staying in your temporary lodge? So this is talking about the temporary lodge we stayed in in Dalton in Furness, near Barrow in Furness, while we were up in Cumbria for a week as our holiday this year. Uh, I think the, probably the best answer to that question is let's go and have a little tour. It's the middle of September. We're staying for the week in the North Lodge to Abbots Wood, which I'll show you what that looks like on the outside. So this is the gatehouse or lodge for what would have been a mansion called Abbot's Wood, which used to be over that way. It's now sadly no longer in existence. It was built for Sir James Ramsden in the 1850s, 1860s, in thanks for his contribution to getting the railway to Barrow in Furness. There is quite a bit of road noise here. Obviously, it's a lodge, which means, you know, by definition, it's uh, next to the road, which would have been the entrance to the grounds and the estate, the Abbot's Wood estate. I expect you want to see inside of this place. So really quick video tour of North Lodge Retreat at Abbot's Wood. Authentic old fashioned bell pool there actually works as a bell pull and everything is kind of well old-fashioned but comfortable so this is the living room the sofa is the best color that's the floorboards from upstairs so the exposed floorboards and beams fireplace we haven't tried out but there are fire lighters and things in that bucket there so i assume that's a working fireplace but this is the main living room. And then through here, a kitchen with a chandelier in it. Look at that ceiling. Quite well equipped kitchen. Very sort of traditional style kitchen. Although lovely modern range style cooker. We've had a great time here. We've been able to cook whatever we wanted to cook and yeah, it's been fine. And the place is dog friendly. So Eva has been made welcome here as well. So that's the downstairs. And I hope you'll agree. It's a really nice looking place. And then upstairs. The bedroom. With some Really lovely little details. Beams and whatnot. I do love these vintage style radiators.
There's a little cloakroom here. A toilet. And then up a few more stairs. There's a big shower room. A wash basin and a walk-in sort of wet room style rain shower. We've been ever so comfortable here. So from the lodge, Abbott's Wood would have been obviously that way, but we can't get to it that way. Well, we can, we can go through the garden, but we're gonna pick up a public footpath that's up this way. So from the back of the lodge, we pick up a public footpath across this field here. So Abbey House was built in the 1850s, 1860s. So a Victorian manor house. It was given to a local industrialist who was instrumental in building the railway. The house unfortunately no longer exists. It was requisitioned by the armed forces and during World War II and presumably used as headquarters or something like that. And then at the end of the war it fell into disrepair and just laid empty and became a ruin. And in the 1970s it was demolished by the government and they built a nuclear bunker here instead. There is no, now no trace of that, but there are traces of the bits and pieces of ruin in the woods. Bits of the house, bits of the various stonework and gates and whatnot in the woods, and that's what we're hoping to find today. Now, as is often the case on a video like this, some people from other places in the world where perhaps where you have public rights of way that are very different from ours are going to think maybe I'm trespassing here. So this is the public footpath. Uh, we'll see markings for that in a moment. There's a stile along here, I think. And we'll probably see a footpath marker. And I'm finding these using the footpath app, which I'll show a bit of footage on the screen right now. But this app's very useful for making sure that you are actually on a public footpath and that you're not trespassing on somebody else's land. So yeah, come out to a stile here for crossing this fence. And well, that would have been a footpath sign there, but the actual sign is nowhere to be found. But a stile like this nearly always indicates that we're on a public right of way because because places where they don't want you to cross the fence and don't want you to walk across the land they don't put styles there so this is abbot's wood well actually well, straight away you can see some stone edging there so this would have been, this is to sort of delineate the edge of a, a bit of land or a bit of planting or something. And there's a channel down here. Now this is an interesting one. I did look the history of this up because the assumption is when you see something like this is that there was a railway or something or a river in this cutting and it passed under the bridge there. The reality is this was a servant's passageway. So this was access to the Abbot's Wood house for the servants. And this was for the servants to bring in the food and provisions and to enter and leave the property as well without being noticed by the guests. So a bit of a kind of class divide thing. This was the servant's passageway. So Abbot's Wood house was was built from the local red sandstone. And so we've got a bit of something here. This is the base of some railings. There would have been iron railings set into this piece here. So that's probably the top of a low wall and there would have been metal railings on top, perhaps. Anyway, we're gonna carry on walking through and we will see, it's a bit of a state fencing here, at various different places. 
there are bits of masonry and traces of the stately home and gardens. So that's the base of a pillar. You can see this sort of, uh, that would have been perhaps a doorway or something. So that's one side of a doorway. That would have been the base of the pillar supporting the roof lintel. There's another section, I think, probably of the pillar piece. So it's uh, got a moulded profile there, you can see. So various bits of stone, probably from the demolition of the house. Another piece of pillar there. Something with a, a lock or a slot for a, a lock bolt to go into. Kind of sad, really, that this place... I saw a picture of it online. I'll put that on the screen. There we go, a piece of rather more intact wall there. You can see the... This has been cut by a machine, this piece of stone. Cut by perhaps like a, a big bandsaw type of device. So those are not hand-hewn blocks of stone. Nice piece of masonry on the top there, very nice detail on it. Onward. And so somewhere around here is the site of where the nuclear bunker would have been. This was a bunker that was built by uh, the government. Basically, it was going to be a control center in the case of a nuclear war in the 1970s. And it's not exactly on the site of the house. And all the remains of it now is some blocks from the demolition of Abbott's Wood House. And these blocks don't mark out the footprint of the house or anything. They're just arranged in a kind of rectangle fashion. The house itself was not on this exact site, but, well, there we go. So it's now just a kind of public garden. There's a rather beaten up picture of what the house would have been. Unfortunately, you can't see that. But yeah, these are just blocks from, from the house that have been arranged here. So the Abbotswood house would have been somewhere here, but not exactly here. And we're going to continue on, and we'll see what else we can find. There might be something else interesting we can find. I think what we'll do now, I doubt we'll see... Oh, well, we might see some more bits and pieces of architecture, but we'll see what else we can find. Maybe we'll find some trees that were planted, ornamental trees that are still here from the old Abb Abbotswood grounds, or maybe just some trees that are planted here since that are interesting to look at. Another chunk of masonry just sitting there loose in the woods. And that's the railway, which is the reason that this house was here. This house was kind of built to uh, reward the guy who got the railway to Barrow and Furness. Well, here's an interesting little thing. I wonder what this was. Looks like maybe a, a little pavilion or something at some point. So there's a pillar base there, something else there and there. I wonder if this was like a little pavilion, perhaps looking out across this little dell. That was definitely not just all that was here. So this is a base, this is a socket that would have perhaps taken timber or perhaps a, a finer stone column that went up here. So I imagine there was maybe a, an archway over here or a little covered pavilion so somebody could sit here, enjoy tea and I think, I think the railway's down there so actually maybe watch the trains go by. So now we're out onto the roadway, and I think probably what we'll just do now is identify some trees. So, and probably just the trees that are a little bit notable. So this one here is white beam. 
and I think this is a cultivated form of white bean because those berries are bigger than I would normally expect to find on a white bean tree. Not actually berries, they're pomes. But anyway, this is white bean. These things make quite a good jelly. A cherry tree there, quite a young one though. That's an azalea, but it's not the really common pink purple one that's very invasive in this country. Don't know what it would have been though, because it's finished flowering. So that may be a remnant of the planting here. It's obviously not the original plant, but that might be a remnant of the planted garden here. And if we walk far enough down here, we'll get to the abbey, or well, the ruin of the of Furnace Abbey. Rowan or mountain ash there, very fine specimen actually. Huge berries for a mountain ash, so it's obviously doing very well here. Again, a very young tree, so not part of the original planting, but maybe a descendant of something that was planted here. There's an elder, black elder. I'm noticing actually we're up here, we're up north, and there are two things going on. One thing is that things like this, the elderberries, are a little bit later than they are down south, but the other, contrarily, the leaves are starting to turn. So it's almost like autumn is just around the corner. In fact, this morning it's quite crisp and fresh and dewy. It feels like the first day of autumn today, middle of September. The weather we left back down south was still the end of summer. So just interesting to see the difference that a few hundred miles can make inside the UK. And a beech tree here, this beech tree has been pollarded, that's why it branches into multiple trunks just above head height. That was done usually well, when you see that a lot of those in a wood, it's because it was done to create poles, harvestable sticks of timber that the deer wouldn't graze off. If you coppice it at ground level, the deer will tend to come and eat all of the new growth. So you coppice at above head height, which is called pollarding, and the tree grows a bunch of straight new branches straight up, which a few years later you come along and harvest, and it does it again and again. However, this tree was last pollarded perhaps 75 to 100 years ago, I would say. And now those big straight poles are trunks of their own. Unfortunately, what tends to happen with these old beech trees that have been pollarded in the past is rot it gets into the crown there where it's all divided and the tree gets to a certain size and then just self-destructs. I have to catch up with Jenny. Jenny's way ahead of me, so let's keep on going. There's quite a lot of this holly here, and this holly is unusual. This is not your common holly. It's got very large, flat, and often thornless leaves, or nearly thornless. So again, this is an ornamental variety that's been planted here or has survived as a seedling from what was planted here before. Just through the tops of the trees here, through little gaps and holes in the foliage, I saw some masonry. So I think down here, this path that branches off to the right here, I think will take us down to Furnace Abbey, or the ruin of Furnace Abbey. So we'll have a look at that. We won't be going in today because unfortunately it's it's owned by English Heritage. I did have English Heritage membership. Jenny and I both had English Heritage membership up until about a month ago. And we ended it because we weren't using it enough. We weren't making use of it. And so we terminated our membership 
and of course now we come here and Furness Abbey is English heritage and it would actually probably be quite interesting to go inside but we're probably not going to do that today. We'll walk around the outside though, hopefully we'll get a decent view of what it looks like from the outside. So yeah, I can start to see bits of stone stonework through the gaps in the trees there. Small diversion of the path here. Let's see what we can see from here. Interesting. This is also a little pathway that comes down to nothing. So perhaps this is the old path. Well, it does look like it's still trodden, at least down to here. So that's the top of Furness Abbey. Steps, stone steps with wet leaves on them. And there. Uh, Slightly inclined stone steps with wet leaves on them, so taking it a bit careful down here. Okay. Right, well when we get back around the corner we'll have a look and see what Furnace Abbey looks like. There we go, Furnace Abbey. It'll be nice when it's finished. Now opposite the Abbey here, there's a big horseshoe shaped hill. I don't know whether this is natural or whether this is a kind of barrow that's been built up in ancient history. I'll look that up and maybe I'll put some information on the screen if I can see it, but it's a kind of semicircular, steep horseshoe shaped, almost like an amphitheater shape, but big. Absolutely huge sight. And I think it's always interesting buildings like this. One thing I've noticed from having toured ruins and things before is that different countries have a and different places have a different attitude towards ruins like this. Uh, I think, for example, in France, a lot of the ancient castles have been continuously occupied and so they tend to be still inhabited and kept up and so a lot of the stuff inside them you know they'll have modern plumbing and modern electrics inside of them obviously the abbey here was not continuously inhabited for various historical reasons which i'm not qualified to talk about so it's interesting to know, what, would, what do you think should happen to a building like this? Should it be maintained as a ruin? That's not easy because everything's exposed to the elements. Should it be restored? 
to something like what it used to be because that's also not necessarily easy. I mean, that's probably quite expensive, but if it was restored, you'd be covering up historical stuff. You wouldn't see the history of this place. And I suppose there's going to be some people who would say it should just be demolished and, and something else should be put here or nothing should be put here. This should be returned to nature. What do you think? I'm not sure it's a question that has a right answer. Here's something down here that I did not expect to see. Not a native plant. These are tomatoes growing in the gutter here. I would imagine somebody must have dropped a slice of tomato from their cheese and tomato sandwich and it washed down and the seeds took root. Something like that. A tomato plant growing in a gutter in England. Anyway, isn't that quite a sight. The sunlight on the dewy grass at Furnace Abbey. I'm assuming these pedestals here in these little niches would have all had statues of saints or something on them. Here you can really see and appreciate the colour of the local red sandstone that this was built from. So we're going to head back now to Abbotswood Lodge and get prepared for another outing somewhere else. I think we might be climbing a hill today, but that'll be a different video. But anyway, that was Furnace Abbey and Abbotswood Lodge and the ruins of Abbotswood House. I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.